All right, so five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Sue Barati. Sue, welcome. Thank you, Guy. All right. So for many years, Sue has worked sector-wide, providing therapy, supervision, training, and consultancy, focusing on developmental trauma and its impact across the lifespan. Sue advocates for children's rights and is trained and presented on topics related to childhood trauma, both across Australia and internationally. She is currently a senior manager with the Australian Childhood Foundation in NSW, Australia. Her role is to oversee a statewide trauma treatment service for children and young people in out-of-home care. All right, Sue, uh, once again, welcome. Share with the listeners um, where you're from originally and where you're calling from now, and we'll dive in. So I haven't moved far from where I uh, was originally. I live in Western Sydney in New South Wales, uh, about 35 minutes from the Sydney Centre. And, uh, and, and I, I work there. I'm based there as well. Okay. All right. All right. So well, let's get in here. So what pulled you, compelled you into this field? Well, I was working in the early childhood sector over 25 years ago. I hate saying that. Um, and I, I was seeing these themes in children where as they came from rough starts, they were continually being marginalised and labelled for their behaviours and how they showed up in the world. And um, I never made the connection back then around disadvantage and trauma being, you know, co coexisting, I guess, mm -hmm. and co-creating futures for these kids. So I retrained and became a child and family therapist. And, and I very soon realised that the greatest impacts for children are the traumas that they experience and the relational ruptures that they, they have which if their parents can't be attuned or their caregivers can't be attuned to providing a safe um, repair, then, you know, they need intensive support. What, what drew you to the field even before that? I mean, when you were younger, did you just have this knack for talking to people or help? What, what was it? I guess I always wanted to do something, whether it was be a teacher or, uh, you know, uh, so, some sort of a helper. Um, you know, I was an adopted child myself. So I think that that unconsciously has drawn me to, you know, the healing space to not only understand my own journey, but to make sense of some things for myself. So I probably never would have said that back when I, when I started, but, but on reflection, it is a big part of, of what probably drew me to this field. Why do you think you would have never said that? I don't think I made the connection because I thought that, you know, I was okay. And as I started understanding about, you know, the impacts of trauma or, or early life experiences on our neurodevelopment, I had to relate that to myself. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess I, I, I developed a greater understanding of, of what we need uh, through, through our lifespan when our relationships um, don't offer us the 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 optimum conditions i guess well, i appreciate you sharing that and i think we'll get back get touch upon that a little later in our conversation but you know initially when i asked you what drew you to the field you talked about a, a specific placement you had and you were seeing these these kids showing up with uh what certain experiences and realized that it was trauma what did you do specifically then? What steps did you take? What realizations did you have? Walk us through that. I was watching the same types of children who came from backgrounds of poverty and disadvantage be continually labelled and seen as the problem and seen as um, that they had in some way a responsibility to fix themselves and be <laughs> socially, you know, um, compliant. And, and it never made sense to me, even though I wasn't trained or understood trauma at that point, you know, I felt that unless there was advocacy or there was 
a way that these children were, were able to be seen differently, what hope would they have? And as they moved out of that early childhood setting into other sectors, you know, school and sports and so forth, those labels stayed with them. And they were seen as, you know, the naughty or the bad children or, or the ones that were going to potentially cause trouble. So they were ostracised or they were kept separate before they even had a chance for people to understand them. And, um, and, and that never made sense to me. And I always saw value and joy in these children in a way that um, I, I wanted to know more about that and how I could actually be an advocate for these children. Because I think being a child therapist, part of an important part of your role is advocacy because a lot of these children don't have a voice. And, and we have a system that is very inconsistent in its approaches to, to trauma treatment for children. And we've, in spite of being, you know, um, uh, operating in a trauma responsive uh, way from the early 2000s, we still don't have a common language across child trauma treatment, which offers an, a, 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 a sensitive way to respond to how these kids show up and they're still labelled and they're still denigrated for their behaviours, which are just asking for us to see them in a way that they can't express through words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well said. It, it really, um, right, the behaviors are the explosions, right, that everyone sees. And it's very uh, easy to not look or not realize that you need to look at what's causing these behaviors. You know, it reminds me, when I was working uh, in a clinic about now, maybe eight, nine years ago, in a in Northern California, we were assessing and treating young kids who were showing early signs of psychosis. Mm -hmm. So part of our job, which I loved, was to take these referral calls and we'd go through these questions and oftentimes there'd just be a litany of these behaviors that this, I mean, sometimes crazy behaviors that these kids were doing and you, at the end of the phone call, you'd have this sheet that you'd look at and you'd go, oh my gosh, what is going on here? And then a week later, what the kid would walk in and sit in the waiting room and you'd like, look at this paper and then, and then it's a kid, it's this little kid coming yeah. in. And it just always blew me away. Like something's going on here. And just, I think it, you said it perfectly, you know, they, they, Right. Yeah, they, they, they are doing these behaviors, but there's a reason there's something going on. And oftentimes it's it's they're not being seen. They haven't been seen. They haven't been loved or tuned or. Yeah, it's uh, one of the reasons why I started this podcast to get the word out about. The, about what trauma is. So anyway, you you got me going here, but continue yeah. so what do you what do you do with this with this knowledge that you have now this realization that you have mm. so I, I strongly believe that as I said before part of our role is, as as trauma therapists for young people and children that advocacy has to become part of of our roles and and that advocacy needs to you know enable us to relanguage this this perception of these children so that Whoever we're talking to, whether that be the professionals in their in their worlds, or you know, particularly for my role at the moment, where I'm working with children in out of home care, who are some of the most vulnerable children in our state. So they've had multiple placement breakdowns. They've been through many many homes. Some of them are living in hotels where they have uh, workers just come through and care for them, mm -hmm. no significant parental figures and so forth. But, but I think to keep those professionals safe in themselves so that they can stay separate enough to be able to do the work, they need to see the child as the problem. They need to see the child in a way that compassion doesn't allow them to, 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 to move into a space where they feel hopeless because I don't think we have a system yet that's set up well enough to support trauma therapists to express 
their distress and the pain that they sit in every day when they work in a trauma saturated environment because it affects us mm -hmm. and it and it bleeds into you know who we are and that part of ourselves that wants to help is often um, pushed aside to have to perform the function of a role which then in turn uh, moves us away from being compassionate and it puts us in a place where we often become directive and we move to a more, I guess, clinical perspective in describing these children in our written materials and in our documentation. I see many, many reports where children are represented um, by words like manipulative and coercive and, um, you know, attention seeking and all those words. And when I see those, I see all those words as as fear driven and I and I you know often say to my staff I wonder what those children are scared of mm. when they're showing up in that way and like you said you know you see this raft of of labels for these children on an intake and you go wow you know these children oh my goodness and often therapists will be scared and they'll be going yes. oh my goodness am I going to be assaulted by this, right. you know, this rap sheet that I've just read on this child right. and 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 this little child comes in with and, their stuffy you know, under their arm and their yeah <laughs> yeah and they've been expelled from kindergarten six times right and I think that, you know, as a community, we've got to do better at, at understanding what children need and being able to lean into a sense of compassion, which doesn't tax us to the point that we become burnt out and that we can use words like love and fear and connection and all of those words that bring us closer to the needs of the child without it costing us and our well-being. And I think that relies on us having systems that support our work where we can show up and know ourselves in a better way so that the things that we're triggered by or the biases that we carry don't become blockades to the work and then cause us to either leave the sector or become that person that labels children. I hear you talking about, uh, uh, well, uh, really two things in a sense. One is an advocacy for the child, but also an advocacy for the therapist too. And understanding, maybe creating, developing, an understanding for what is required to, to do this work, what is required of the therapist. Let's focus there. What do you say more about that? Mm. I often think that both in our training and in our workplaces, that we don't get given the opportunity or the permission to know ourselves and continually learn and develop both personally and professionally in a way that's safe. We're, we're driven to perform or to function in our role and, you know, uh, meet targets and, and criteria that uh, are numbers and funding driven. And often the needs or the, the well-being of the therapists are kind of, you know, forgotten about. Once mm -hmm. you're employed in a role, you, you know, that often organizations tick boxes and they say, right, you know, you get your monthly or six weekly supervision and you've got to survive till then. And when you think about trauma being pervasive and, and how it saturates our lives, particularly with children who often are absolutely helpless and they're relying on their therapist to be their messenger into the system or they're relying on their therapist to be their significant relationship when they don't have any others, it's a huge responsibility to carry. And we all get into this work because we have a heart for the work and we have a yearning to help. But I guess the greater the vulnerability and the greater the responsibility, we need a, a, a more robust system to support therapists to feel safe in their working environment so that they can do these roles and do them with compassion. Let me just uh, reintroduce you here. I'm speaking with Sue Barati. 
Um, Sue is the senior manager with the Australian Childhood Foundation in NSW Australia. So specifically, Sue, what are you doing in this role? So our, our program uh, works to provide an outreach therapy service to children in out-of-home care that have had multiple placement breakdowns, and that's a statewide project. We're government-funded, and our therapists can go anywhere in New South Wales um, to provide therapy to children who are really struggling in terms of their relationships with their carers, who may be being... Um, expelled or ostracized from their school environments who are just in general you know struggling due to the lack of consistency in their relationships across their lifespan they've often had traumas that have begun before the age of one mm. so thinking about conceptualizing their treatment through a developmental trauma lens is very important and we've got an, an incredible team of both um Indigenous and non-Indigenous team members who offer that that face-to-face -face outreach treatment, regardless of where the child is. And oftentimes their placements will change. So they'll go from one part of the state to another. And New South Wales is a very big state. It's thousands and thousands of kilometres wide. So when you think about a therapist that might start off with a child in one part of the state and they have three placement breakdowns, wow. They follow that child. So the relationship is sustained. Their connection to that therapist is sustained. And, and we're having terrific outcomes with that model. Wow. Um, I, I want to get back to uh, what you said about the therapist. And you said something very important to me, which was that you feel we need, therapists need to know themselves need opportunities what do you when you say that what do you mean specifically i think that we we as we grow professionally with every session or every conversation we have particularly when we work with children we learn more about ourselves when we when we are child therapists we sit with the experience of ourselves every time we talk to a child. When we're working in other sectors, you know, if, if potentially drug and alcohol, for instance, we may not necessarily have previously been an addict and walked in that, that client's shoes. Mm. But we've all been children. And the experience of being a child and, and the essence of, of your own childhood with either unconsciously or consciously always shows up so I think to be able to have the opportunity to learn about what that means and what things come up for you and to be able to discuss that in your supervision or to be guided back to your own therapy through supervision requires a great deal of safety in your relationship and and I think we can do better at that. I have to say the, the Australian Childhood Foundation does it really well because the, the work that we do is only with children who have experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. So there's a deep understanding of, of what's required to do that work. But, but you know, I think sector-wide, we, we can do better at supporting our staff uh, to, to have permission to, to deeply know yourself and to deeply understand what motivates your clinical work, the way you show up with your with your clients and your peers, we have many uh, and diverse skill sets and qualifications across our sector. You know, um, to be a trauma therapist, you may be many things. You may be mm -hmm. a, an occupational therapist. You may be a psychologist or a social worker or a counsellor. You may be many other things. So I think that we don't have consistency in that way so that there is an overarching principle that guides um, our, our approaches. Oftentimes we rely on our individual resourcing for our own well-being. When did you realize this part of the story, if you will, this part of the uh, aspect of, of working in your field, this aspect of one's inner work and the important significance of that? I think as I, as a supervisor, as I watched great counsellors burn out time after time and not, and, and 
at the start of their careers be brilliant therapists that could do incredible work with children and a few years down the track become those therapists that use descriptors like manipulative and, and um, you know, and reading their case notes. And it was so obvious that they had moved away from, from being close to that child and their relational needs because they couldn't offer a close relationship in their therapeutic work. So they they were, you know, it was, it was evident that they were burning out. And, and I... I, I thought about that a lot and I wondered whether that was because the, just the level of trauma saturation wasn't able to be dispersed in a way that provided them safe uh, you know a safe return back to that baseline yeah I mean I, one of my thoughts has always been that you know people get into this field for a variety of reasons and you know one of which obviously is they want to you know help and that can be defined in many ways, but oftentimes there's a, a, a difference and a disconnect between, you know, wanting to help someone and, and being asked or even called to, wait a minute, I've, I've got to explore what's going on with me. You're asking me, I have, wait a minute, I just want to work over here, right? <laughs> but that's a whole different dynamic because like Absolutely. you said, you know, your your whether consciously or not, your experience in this case of being a kid is coming into the room. That's mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. Every time, every single yeah, yeah. Everyone's had a rupture with a parent. Everyone's had an issue where they felt unsafe. You know, whether it be a significant trauma, or or whether it just be you know a small part of your your history it, it it ultimately comes up and takes over and the part of your brain that that you know requires you to show up to be fully present to a child often isn't activated at that point because you've gone back into your own survival mm -hmm. state so so that survival state disconnects you from from being present to that child and children are so good at reading adults you know, they can immediately see when, when that's happening. And when that happens session after session after session, I think there's a toll on the therapist because they know intuitively that they're not showing up in the way in which they either used to or they should be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we develop mechanisms to protect ourselves and it almost becomes a parallel process where we're defending ourselves by, by putting up, you know, a barrier or a shield around the distress of the child so that we don't have to go there ourselves. Speaking of barriers and, and defenses, could you share kind of an early clinical error, mistake, breach you, you experienced? Yes. I, I think that um, one of the most consistent errors I made was expecting regardless of their age, people to show up chrono at their chronological age mm. who'd experienced a trauma and, and it just was never going to happen. So as soon as we got to the part of the work that uh, required them to think about their own trauma, regardless if they were 45 or 6, um, they were always going to land at the place where their trauma first affected them. So when that penny dropped, I became a much more fulfilled and successful therapist. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. No, I, I just think you, you put it really well. I mean, and I don't know if anyone's ever shared that particular uh, insight or, uh, you know, meeting with someone and expecting them to show up at their chronological age in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, our schools expect it, our systems expect it. Um, you know, in out-of-home care here in New South Wales, we expect children at 16 to, to move into independent living. And often developmentally, there's such a mm -hmm. mismatch in terms of their capacity and their you know, chronological age. So it's so important to think about when we're working with trauma. When you realize that you know you wanted to explore and learn more about trauma where did you start what modalities did you begin to study or look at 
Mm. Well, back when I was studying, attachment theory was a big one. And um, I really um, invested in that. As, as time went on, um, I, I moved into, you know, the more um, neuro influence theories. I, I uh, became NMT certified. I um, followed Bruce Perry and his work for a long time and, and uh, I'm still NMT certified. So Bruce who? I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that now, you know, that guides everything that I do. And I think about how the brain governs the body and in turn, how the body then interprets what the brain's telling it and how that influences uh, particularly how children and young people show up. So we have to consider regulation and relationships all the time in our therapeutic treatment. Um, in, in terms of the, the people that are coming to you, the therapists that are coming to you, when you are interviewing someone or bringing someone on board, what, do you, what qualities are you looking for? I look for just... A, a, a level of genuineness and, and openness to knowing more. And I think when that's an inherent trait in somebody, it can apply to themselves. Because as I've said, we need trauma therapists for children that want to be curious and they want to be able to sit in that and be comfortable in curiosity, both for what's happening for the client, but also for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because in supervision, I'll ask someone in that moment, when you ask that question, what was happening for you? What did you feel in your body? And I expect them to know that. Right. You expect them to know that. Yeah. yeah. Again, I'm brought back to the, the thought of what do you mean me? What, why do I have to look at me? What I'm, I'm working with this kid over here. Yeah. Man. We're well, the look. most important tool in the shed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sue, I love talking to you and love the work you're doing. Um, it's, it's really inspiring. Where can people connect with you, learn more about you? So the Australian Childhood Foundation has a website. We have a range of free resources. Uh, we're a national organisation um, and we, we, we specialise in working with childhood trauma. So uh, I encourage everyone to reach out to access the website www.acf.org.au and um, I can send you that link. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I, I have it here. I'll put it up on the uh, show notes page at the trauma therapist podcast.com. Awesome. You, awesome. Uh, let me, before we go here, uh, any go-to book recommendations? Give me one. Uh, the realm of the hungry ghosts by Gabor Mate. That's, okay. uh, I'm reading that at the moment. Okay. We'll put that up there too. Sue. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, join me today. I loved it. Thank you guy.